All right. I love that picture on the, that last song. Jesus Christ on the throne. Because whoever the earthly kings are, whoever the president is, Jesus is on the throne. And uh, we sing that, uh, that Getty song, There is a Higher Throne. Aren't we glad of that? Uh, that's why it's important that we rest in those facts. Open your Bibles to Daniel, the book of Daniel. I'm going to begin uh, what I'm calling a short series. I don't know how short it will be. I, my intention is not to go verse by verse through Daniel. Uh, my, my intention is to be very specific in using Daniel as a topical study on the topic, how to survive. No, not how to survive, but how to thrive. But I get ahead of myself. Let's read the uh, first chapter, Daniel. We, we, we will read the uh, whole first chapter. Uh, again, it was not going to be a verse-by-verse -verse exposition like we did through the book of Ephesians. But uh, there's great principles here that we see in Daniel's life. Daniel was one of two men in the scripture of which there is no specific statement of sin. Now, we know that all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, so we know that they weren't perfect, but as far as the biblical record go, you know, Daniel was squeaky clean. And actually in his life, he was pretty doggone squeaky clean if he wasn't <laughs> completely um, that's why I'm called Joe Daniel. That's my middle name is Daniel because I'm squeaky clean. Don't say anything, Pam. <laughs> but <laughs> no comment. That's the safest thing. But, uh, but Daniel is a great man and he lived in hard times. And what we want to learn from Daniel is how to live in these hard times and flourish as a believer. So let's read these, uh, this first chapter. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, which with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. And then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had the ability to serve in the king's palace and, with, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily portion of the king's delicacies, of the, and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of their time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the king of the, the eunuchs gave, excuse me, to them the chief of the eunuchs gave names of, to Daniel he gave Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the, the chief of the eunuchs. The chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who had appointed your food and drink. Why, for why should he see in your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then he would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward and, and whom the chief of this, the eunuchs had set over, David, over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and, and Azariah, please test your servants for ten days. 
Let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this manner and tested them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Then the steward took away their portions of delicacies and the wine that they drank and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. And for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought in the men before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found, like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king. And in all manners of wisdom and understanding about whom the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who in their, were in their realm. Then Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. I titled the message this morning, oops, turned it on, Thrive, Just Don't Survive. Don't just survive. Thrive, don't just survive. And as I've already stated, I'm going to start this short series. I've titled the series, Living as a Successful Believer in a Secular Society. Now that's a highfalutin title maybe. But I was trying to get at the point that we live in a secular society. There's no question about it. And uh, I wanted to find that. The word secular means relating to, and this is according to dictionary.com, relating to worldly things or to things that are not regarded as religious, spiritual, or sacred. So when we talk about a secular society, we're talking about a society that does not welcome religious, spiritual, or sacred ideas. I think you would agree with that, right? By that, I mean our society has departed from any, or at least very little, consideration of what we would consider spiritual. We've seen that coming. We've seen that coming back in uh, 1962 or 3, I forget what year, the outlaw school and pr- or prayer in school in the Supreme Court. And somehow, you know, 150 years after the writers of our foundation, foundational documents, they have found a separation of church and state that never existed for that 150 years from a letter written by Thomas Jefferson, not in the Constitution. You hear people say, and, and, don't, and challenge them on it, they say, well, separation of church and state's in the Constitution. No, it's not. In fact, just whip out a copy of your Constitution, carry around, and say, find it for me. They can't because it's not in there. But since that time, they have whittled away at any impact that sacred, spiritual, or religious ideas have in our society. We've seen it growing in strength, but I'm afraid we've not seen the pinnacle yet. I think it's going to get worse and worse and worse. and, And it's moving pretty fast moving pretty fast. My uh, friend Luke Voschek sends me a few articles every once in a while and he sent me a video the other day done by Natural, National Geographic. <laughs> if you can imagine that. Talking about the new movement of gender transition from little boys into little girls. There's a church 
universalistic church, but has a ceremony where they bring, like we dedicate babies, they bring these little boys in their dresses to the church and have a ceremony of what they celebrate. They're changing their gender. You know, I, and I got to say, I worry because I personally heard our, the, the president will be, that will be inaugurated, unless the Lord does a miracle, on Wednesday say to a mother of a seven-year-old boy who wants a, a, law, a law that her seven-year-old boy could change his gender to a girl, said, we need to have a law like that. Try speaking against that and see what you get. Because we live in a world where, in a society, in a world, I guess I could say, but specifically in our society, where biblical values and mores are not welcome. Traditional values and standards are not welcome. Not even traditional ones. <laughs> but biblical ones especially. And the truth is, is they're not just ignored, they're shouted down. You've seen that happen. I mean, they won't even let them speak on college campuses. Even, even our own Christian university that many of us have great connections with, through a fit over having a, the vice president of the United States come because he's too conservative, which being interpreted means he has some biblical values and mores. We feel pretty helpless. We feel pretty helpless. So the question becomes, how can we deal with what we're going through? What, what should, how should we conduct ourselves in an increasingly secular society where we are not welcome to speak? <laughs> Freedom of speech? Forget that. Tell you, I'm very concerned. I'm not Freddy. I'm not fretting. That's not Freddy. I'm not Freddy. But I'm not fretting. But there's coming a day, and maybe not too far in advance if some, some people get their way, where we will not be allowed in this building to say what the Bible says. Because it's unacceptable hate speech. So how can we deal with what we're living with? That's why I've chose this study. Because Daniel was living in a situation much like ours. Daniel was living in a situation much like ours. But the truth is, <laughs> it was much worse. It was much worse. Yeah, we feel pretty sorry for ourselves. <laughs> or at least I'll speak for myself. I feel pretty sorry for myself. But Daniel's situation was much worse as he was in Babylon. And yet, in spite of that, he became influential. He didn't just exist. He became influential under at least four very pagan kings. 
That's amazing. I mean, he was a leader under four pagan kings. That just didn't happen in those days. When pagan kings took over from another king, they wiped out the leaders in the former cabinet. They either excommunicated them or they killed them, usually the latter. And yet Daniel not only survived, but he was able to influence and thrive under four very pagan kings. And this is the list of the kings. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Belshazzar, followed up Nebuchadnezzar as king of, Belsha, uh, of, of Babylon. Darius, the Mede, who captured Babylon and the Median Empire took over. And then Media lost to Persia and Cyrus, which we saw that Daniel lived until the first year of King Cyrus. And so how did he, th how did he thrive? How did he influence this? This was all in spite of things that sound familiar to us. An illegitimate government. An illegitimate government. Now for four years, we heard that Trump was an illegitimate president. Now we hear Biden's an illegitimate president. Only God knows the truth. But we hear about illegitimate governments. Well, I'll tell you what, there's not any more illegitimate government than a government that lays siege to a city until it's destroyed and then carries the people off. Now that is an illegitimate government. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to, to Jerusalem three times before it completely fell. But it finally fell, and he raided and destroyed the city. And we find here that he carried off many things, not the least of which was Daniel and the other young men. And the reason they carried him off is because they were such outstanding young men. <laughs> there used to be a book called Outstanding Young Men of America. I think it was a sales play mainly, but... Uh, these were outstanding young men, it said, and, and maybe it's my parents named me Daniel, not because of my squeaky clean, but because I was so good looking. Well, where was that? Uh, they, were, they were good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, quick to understand, had ability to serve in a king. Maybe that's why they named it. But anyway, <laughs> it's potluck, wasn't it? <laughs> and failure. But they carried these, these men off, these young men, because they wanted to use them. They didn't love these people. They didn't say, oh, we want to take care of you. No, they wanted to, to use them for their own purpose. They just wanted some puppets. But good puppets. Quality puppets. Now, I have the chance in this message to irritate many people. And I probably do many times anyway. But, you know, right now I might ruffle some feathers, but many of us believe there were some shenanigans that transpired in the last election. I chose the word shenanigans because I like that word. We don't know exactly what happened. Nobody does. And I, for one, I just go on record in case anyone wondered that I am not pleased with the way things turned out. However, banning or barring a miracle, barring a miracle, 
Someone once said, it is what it is. If God lets stand, after Wednesday we'll have a new administration. We'll deal with it. Just as Daniel had to deal with an illegitimate government. He was, I mean, Daniel was carried off as a prisoner. But in spite of the government he was under, he was able to thrive. We also see that in spite of not only an illegitimate government, but an educational indoctrination. I think uh, Daniel and the others were to be able to, were to be taught to think like a Chaldean. It said here in the scripture, it says that they would learn, that they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. In verse, the end of verse 4 there. And they were going to train them for three years. Basically, they were going to indoctrinate them into the Chaldean philosophies, the Chaldean way of thinking, the Chaldeans and the Babylonians are the same people in case you, there's confusion there. But they were going to indoctrinate them into how to think. Well, we are concerned about some of the stuff we hear about what's being taught in some schools especially higher education. We're concerned about our kids being taught things that you know, are in opposition to what parents believe. We've heard two different things this past week on the news that were outrageous. And we know that much of it is against the principles of the parents. But the sad fact is, is Daniel had no parents to try to straighten him in the situation. Now please don't, I, I said I can ruffle many feathers <laughs> these day, with this message. But I'm just saying that Daniel was being indoctrinated into the Chaldean way of thinking for all these years. Don't misunderstand that I'm criticizing schools, although I'd criticize some of what goes on in I mean, I got grandchildren in public school, I've got grandchildren in private school, I've got grandchildren in home school, so we're covering the bases. But here we have an illegitimate government and educational indoctrination and thirdly, a decadent culture. A decadent culture. It's a culture that is decaying. And quite frankly, it stinks. And his culture stunk. The Babylonian Empire was well known for its cruelty and its wickedness. They were butchers. When they would go in and into a battle, they they were just out of control. <laughs> they would just dismember, abuse. In fact, 
their motor, modus operandi was perverse. Their morals were perverse. They were characterized by murder, torture, and rape. I don't, don't want to go into too much detail of, of some of the research I did, but one thing that, that uh, Nebuchadnezzar did was when he took one king, he raped his wife and his mother in front of him before he impaled him on a stake. That's what kind of culture, that's what kind of king this man was that Daniel was going to serve under. The perverse treatment of their enemy, the men, was disgusting. Immorality, licentiousness, which means any kind of evil you can think of, was their standard. It was a horrible place with horrible morals. But not only were their morals perverse, but their religion was godless. The religion was godless, which leads to all these other things. It's quite telling that they didn't worship God, they worshiped gods, little g. The scripture says here in verse 2, he said, articles of the house of God was carried to the land of Shinar to the house of his God. Notice that articles from the house of big G God, the true God, were carried to the house of his little G God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his little G God. That's what happens to a culture that has a religion that's godless. And so we have an illegitimate government. We have a, an indoctrination of edu an educational indoctrination. We have a decadent culture. And this was what this young man at age 15 or 16 was thrust into. And we feel sorry for us. Well, yeah, we do. <laughs> I'll just be honest. Do we feel stressed at what we see today in our world, in our, in our country, in our beloved country, I might add? I scream out, indeed. Yes, we do. We are stressed. But what about Daniel? 16 approximate years old, thrust into this, carried off as a prisoner, indoctrinated in how he should think, living in a horrendous society of, of immorality and godlessness, and yet he thrived. He thrived. So the question then is, what can we learn from this young man as he excelled in the heathen culture? How did he do it? What kept his head above the water? Because we feel like we're drowning. How did he not only survive but thrive in this heathen culture. Well, that's what this series is all about, obviously. 
the principles that guided Daniel will enable us to survive if we follow them. Today, we're going to see in this passage three principles. I haven't determined how many principles we find in this, in this book. More than three. But the first principle we find here that's going to help us to thrive is we do not, we do not find him fretting about the situation. Now, I'm sure that uh, he had a lot of emotions going through his mind as he was being carried off in the captivity and separated from his parents and his family who were probably slaughtered back in Jerusalem. I'm sure he wasn't happy about the way things were. But I want you to notice that they did not consume him. They did not consume him. You see, some of you are going to think I'm preaching to you, but I'm going to tell you who I'm preaching to. This guy right here. This guy right here. Because you know I'm a news junkie. And it's real easy for me to get consumed with what's going on and get eaten up by it. Now, I'm sure Daniel had his moments. But we do not see any record where he sat around fretting about these things. That's why in this morning in Sunday school, we looked at Psalm 37. Three times in Psalm 37, it says, fret not. We talked about what that word means. It means, first of all, not to worry, of course. But then it also means to not be furious, not to be to grow angry, not to be out of control, which is what has happened to some. And we understand that. There's a lot of frustration. But we don't find Daniel fretting. Psalm 37 1 says, do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. Verse 7 says, rest in the Lord, wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. And also in verse 8, it says, cease from anger, forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. And you know who it causes harm to the most? Us. Us. It eats us up. It makes us miserable. It makes us bitter. It makes us angry people. God says, don't fret. And we don't find Daniel fretting. We don't find him sitting around getting furious because of the situation he's find himself, found himself in. And then secondly, we find that he submitted, except when it violated his faith. This horrible man, Nebuchadnezzar, who was so disgusting in so many ways, Daniel submitted to the king, except when he couldn't. And then it was a matter of his faith. You know, we see that Daniel always cooperated. Did I not have that up? I didn't look. Was that up already? Okay. That's good. I hit the clicker and it didn't move. But We see that he always cooperated with the king except when it conflicted with his God. Now make sure 
that it conflicts with God. Because it's awful easy to, to raise some things up to the standard of a faith, our faith. We need, to, we need to be crystal clear that if we rebel, that it's for biblical principles. Because Daniel submitted except where it violated his faith. Now we do see that he appealed through proper channels when he could. He approached the chief of the eunuchs and, and said, you know, would like not to participate in this, the king's meal, meat and his wine. And he appealed. That's okay. We go through legal channels. That's the nice thing about living in what has been our country. <laughs> we did have recourse. And that's okay. That's what Daniel did. But Daniel was a model citizen. Now, getting ahead of ourselves, going to chapter 6... Verses 3 through 5, it says, Then Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because of the excellent spirit that was in him. And the king gave, him, gave thought to him, sitting over the whole realm. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful. Neither was there any error or fault found in him. These men said, we cannot find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. This tells us that in spite, in spite of the government he was under, in spite of the educational indoctrination they had, they had forced upon him, in spite of the, the disgusting culture he lived in, Daniel was squeaky clean. There's an excellent spirit in him. And then we find in verse, verses 6 and 10, we find that they found the way to get him according to his God because they went to Nebuchadnezzar and said, okay, Nebuchadnezzar, if there, excuse me, this was Darius by, the, Darius by this time, not Nebuchadnezzar. Darius... Unless, if anyone prays to any other God except you, they need to be killed, thrown into the lion's den. And so, this is what we find about Daniel. In verses 10 through 11 of chapter 6. Now, when Daniel knew that writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before God, as was his custom. From her, since early days, then those men assembled and found Daniel praying and, and making supplication before his God, and we'll, you know the rest of the story. As hard as it is, he submitted, except when it violated his faith. So he didn't fret, didn't sit around getting angry and furious. He submitted except when he couldn't because, you know, as the apostle said, is that we've got to obey God rather than man. But most importantly, he refused to compromise his principles. He refused to compromise his principles. Verse 8, key, key verse of Daniel's life and ought to be a key verse of our life. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, of the king's delicacies, or with the wine that he drank. The key phrase, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. In the face of a cruel and unjust government, 
in the face of being indoctrinated, in the face of all opposition, he stood tall and said, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to defile myself with the king's meat. And the fact that in this time of, of secularism, we have to stand for the principles of our faith. If we don't do it, who's going to do it? Now, we don't know exactly why Daniel made such a strong stand on this, because obviously the rest of the, the Jewish uh, boys did not make this stand, just the four boys. And we don't know, like I say, for certain to hear, but pretty, pretty sure that it was because before this, the, the meat and the drink would come to these guys, it would be offered to the idol and ask the idol to bless it. And Daniel said, I'm not going to eat what's been offered to idols. In the New Testament, we got a different situation. But here, Daniel, based on his, the principles of his faith, said, I'm not eating that. And I'm not drinking that. He said, give me water and vegetables. Now, that shows how desperate he was. <laughs> but what Daniel did is, in this face of all this adversity, he made a firm commitment before God. He made a firm commitment. He wasn't wishy-washy. He wasn't, well, I'll try. It says he purposed in his heart. He purposed in his heart. He made a commitment before God that he was not going to, to mess up here because the second part of it is he refused to be defiled. Now, the Apostle Paul would say what goes into a man doesn't defile him, but Daniel was under Old Testament law and he knew that the things offered to idol were anathema. They were, they were bad stuff. And he said, I'm not going to be defiled. Because he knew that in this society, this second society, this second, he could not control the wickedness around him. He couldn't stop Nebuchadnezzar from being such a, a, a brutal animal. He couldn't stop the people of Babylon committing all kinds of fornication and disgusting, perverse behavior. He knew he could not control that, but he could control the wickedness within himself. He could control the wickedness within himself. You see, there's very little we can do to stop our culture from behaving the way it does. But what we can do is stop us from behaving badly. And he did. And he did. So what happened as a result? First of all, God gave him favor. It said... Back in verse 9, now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. Because of Daniel's conduct, of his commitment, and his refusal to be defiled, God brought him into favor. <laughs> this is unheard of. This is unheard of a captive, a prisoner, 
rising to the almost the pinnacle, not quite the pinnacle, <laughs> to a to a high place in a pagan government. It just didn't happen. But God gave him favor because of his behavior. I just made a poem. God gave him favor because of his behavior. But that wasn't all. Because this, this scripture goes on and tells us that God gave him strength. God gave him strength. You know, he's, he told the, uh, the chief of the eunuchs, he said, check us out. And see if we're, in, because of, he was worried, well, if you don't eat this, this really good stuff, you're going to get emaciated and you're going to look, your color's not going to be good and, and they'll be able to tell that you haven't been eating well. But God intervened and he gave him strength. He said, it says in verse 15, it says, In the end of ten, 10 days their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men that they did the portion of the king's delicacies. It says, That he was strong, physically conditioned. But not only that, but God gave him understanding. God gave him understanding. He says, verse 17, as for these four men gave them knowledge and skill and all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And it says in verse 19, when he brought them in, there was none found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. This is a God thing. But it was a Daniel thing too. Because Daniel determined in his heart that it, Whatever circumstance he found himself in, he was not going to cave. He was not going to give in to his emotions. He wasn't going to give in to, you know, to compromise his standards. He was going to stand strong and follow his convictions. Was it easy? I really doubt it. He was just a young man. So was it easy? No. But was God pleased? <laughs> we know he was. These are hard principles because it goes against our nature, especially us independent conservatives types. But this is what I believe God's teaching us. We live in a decadent secular society. It is wicked out there. But what God's telling us is that our responsibility is to stay clean. Stay clean. We don't have to be messed up by the world because we know the God with the big G. And he will give us favor, strength, and understanding. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Daniel and his example. What a man that he was. A young man, just a kid, even though our 16-year-olds would be insulted by that. <laughs> but in truth, just a, just a very young person, and yet he was able to overcome the secular society he lived in. May we learn and may we apply these principles to our lives.